All right, so today's lesson is about population growth. Today is November 24th. I know it says the 23rd, but we are a day behind because of our work day last Thursday. That's okay. It is the third day of our ninth unit. And the objective of this lesson is to under to identify and analyze the factors that affect population growth by competing graph analyses. And the essential question, what are the factors that will determine how a population will grow? So take time to get your notes out, write down the title of the lesson, and then we will move on. Okay. All right. So I want someone to unmute themselves and answer some of at least one of these questions. So if we're looking at this animation here, we should see that the population rate is reflected based on how big the countries are. So the more bloated the country is, that's where the population is growing pretty rapidly since 1800. All right. So we can see in the 1800s, most of the growth again was in Asia. Then it kind of shifted west. Now in uh, for the 2000s and even going forward, we can expect that a vast majority of the growth is going to be taking place in Africa and Asia. Oh, I guess I just answered the first question. But why do you all think that such dramatic population growth is occurring in, in those places? Why is there so much population growth in those places? There's Malachi. Why is there so much population growth taking place in, in those places? Places like Asia and Africa? Yes. Um, I think um, I think because they're really big um, continents and there's a lot of space. Okay, yeah, that's part of the reason for sure that people are now being, they're now able to spread out more. Uh, there's just much more space for people to exist. Um, in the United States, uh, certainly parts of the country are running out of space. Now, we might think of the Midwest and uh, the western part of our country as having a lot of space where people can spread out, but a lot of that space is designated farmland or designated conservation areas or uh, Native American reservations. So there, there aren't as many opportunities for growth based on that fact alone. That's a good point. Anything else? Is it because the population is already big? Certainly that plays a role, yeah. When you already have a large number of people, the opportunity for growth is greater because more people are gonna have more kids. That's a good point. Anything else we wanna point out? Okay, uh, and as we're gonna to discuss today, a big factor in population growth, whether you're talking about human beings or other animal species, plant species, bacterial species, the, uh, one, of the, one, one of the big factors is going to be the availability of resources. All right, so uh, populations grow where resources are readily available. Uh, in some of the richer countries, resources aren't always as available as you might think when we think about the economic opportunities to find jobs where you can earn a living. Um, but in some of the poorer countries, the opportunity for growth is still there because they're still living in what we call subsistence agriculture. They are feeding themselves, they're farming for themselves and their families, and so the opportunity for growth is still there. Of course, there are some dangers of this type of exponential population growth, um, and we're going to explore some of those dangers today as well. <clears throat> but <clears throat> When we think about the growth of a population, we have to acknowledge that there are limiting factors that prevent that population from growing exponentially. So a limiting factor is defined as a biotic or abiotic variable 
that constrains a population size and prevents it from growing exponentially. So go ahead and write down that definition, please. Some examples of limiting factors include food, land, and water. Some additional examples include temperature, the number of mates that are available, and altitude. So as we can see, some of these are biotic, like the number of mates, and in some cases, the amount of food available. But there are also abiotic factors that might limit a population's growth. So please do also write down the examples. Food, land, water. Land was the one that Gabby spoke to. And then I guess the one that, I, that Alicia spoke to was the number of mates available. Do colder climates have generally less people than warmer climates? Yes, absolutely. Um, the primary reason for that is there's a term called arability. Arability is basically the um, how well or how easy it is for food to be grown in an area. So an arable land is land where you can easily grow food. The soil is very healthy. Year after year, you can continue to plant. As long as you're you know, planting responsibly, you can continue to grow crops there. Most cold places are not arable. The land is not arable for one reason or another. The oxygen uh, levels might be low. The soil is hard. There aren't many nutrients in the soil or it might literally be under ice. So um, colder places are just much less arable. All right. When we also think about how we calculate growth rate, we have to take into uh, account these four things, the number of births in the population, the number of deaths in the population, the availability of resources available to living individuals in the population, and the amount of competition that takes place in the population. Obviously, if you have a high number of births and a low number of deaths, then your population is going to grow very rapidly. If you have about equal number of births as you do death, then your population size is not going to grow. But if you say, let's say you have a lot of competition for those resources or there's not a lot of resources available, your population size might actually begin to shrink over time. We can also classify those limiting factors that we just introduced in, in two ways. There are density independent factors. These are factors that influence a population's birth or death rates regardless of the population density. So density is a term that means how much of something is there in a given unit of volume or in a given unit of area. So for example, the population density of Charlotte is much greater than the population density of, let's say, Wilmington. Or, and the population density of Wilmington is much greater than the population density of some rural part of North Carolina. I don't even know. There are more people living closer together in an urban area than there would be on a farm.
So these factors, these independent, these density independent factors don't care about how many people there are living in a given unit of area. It doesn't matter if we're talking about Charlotte or Wilmington or Greensboro or Rocky Mount. It doesn't matter how many people there are living in that given area. Uh, these factors are going to affect the population size in the same way, regardless. So temperature is a, is a density independent factor. If it's too cold, then it doesn't matter how many people there are. It's just not going to be conducive to life. Natural disasters are also a density independent factor. If a forest fire wipes out an entire population of koala bears, it didn't necessarily matter if there was one koala bear there or a million koala bears. That forest fire was going to destroy all of the habitat. And so the, the, the living population would be wiped out. And then oxygen levels play a big role when we think about Oxygen levels play a big role when we think about um, marine life. We also have density dependent factors. So these are the opposite. They do depend on the number of individuals in the population and how closely together they live. So this is any influence on a population's birth or death rates whose effect varies based on the density of the population. So for example, a bacterial disease, if you have five individuals living in a population, but they never come in contact with one another, if only one of them gets that bacterial disease, then there's no opportunity for them for that disease to spread. But if they're living in close proximity to one another, then that, that disease is going to spread relatively easily. So the density really does matter when we're talking about that type of limiting factor. Competition is the same way. If the population is very well spread out, as we know some mammal populations are, for example, um, some, wolf, some wolf populations are pretty spread out. You might only hunt in a pack of four or five wolves, but the population itself is, is spread pretty thoroughly throughout um, that area. You're not competing for all of the same resources. But if you've got all of the individuals living very closely together, then they have to compete for resources. And then, ooh, that shouldn't say oxygen level. That should say... And then predation is also a density dependent factor. If there are more prey in an area, then the predators are going to be able to survive uh, at higher rates. If there are fewer less prey in an area, then uh, the predators are going to struggle.
All right, so nothing to write down here, but we discussed this a little bit a few days ago. Currently, the human population is about 7.8 billion people. Um, and it's continuing to rise. It's expected to continue to rise until about 2100, 2100. So some of you will probably still be alive when the population stops growing, which is going to be a pretty momentous occasion because that will represent probably the first time in human history that that, that, that has happened. Because every year since the 1800s, when we had accurate counts of the global population size, the population has risen by about, the, the growth rate has risen by about one to 2%, which means that the population growth was accelerating. We have existed in an exponential growth rate pattern. So this is kind of cool. Let's see. Already today, there have been over 170,000 people who have been born. Over 70,000 people have died, which means that the population today alone, and it's only 1047 Eastern time, uh, today alone, the population has grown by 100,000 people. This year, we're already about 73 million people have been added to the population. So we will hit 8 billion at some point in the next two years or so, year and a half. As I said, humans right now, the human population is growing exponentially, which means that the growth is occurring rapidly due to an unlimited availability of resources. Now, we obviously don't have unlimited availability of resources but we still have enough to support a growing population. And so this is what we can see the graph looks like, right? It looks like a J. We call this a J curve. And what we mean by exponential growth is that we're not going one, two, three, four, five. We're talking about one becoming two and two becoming four, four becoming eight, eight becoming 16. Six be seen becoming 32 very quickly. So the population increases dramatically in a very short period of time. As we can see today, we already added 100,000 people to the population size. Do you think people will stop um, reproducing, like bring more um, babies born? due to COVID? Uh, that's an interesting question. I, I, think, <clears throat> I think I actually saw a study that showed that more people, more women are pregnant um, in 2020 than there have been in previous years because people are, for a number of reasons, there are economic factors that play a role, but number one, people are just in the house more, which means there's more opportunity to uh, conceive a baby. Um, so I think also economically, uh, certain people in our country have done well during the pandemic. And so this provided an opportunity for them to have to start a family or to grow their family. So we'll see. That's a good question. Every population has what's called a, or every environment has a specific carrying capacity. And this is the maximum population size that can be sustained in an ecosystem based on the amount of resources that are available. So once a population grows exponentially and then hits that carrying capacity, some of the individuals are going to die. The population is going to shrink a little bit because there simply won't be enough resources available to them. And so the population will drop back down, then it'll grow a little bit more. And once it exceeds the carrying capacity, it'll drop down again. Then it will grow more, then drop down again. And so this is what we, will, we can typically expect to see <clears throat> happen in, in the year 
2100. This is what we expect to see happen in 2100. Unfortunately, there will probably be a pretty uh, a large die off. <clears throat> Hopefully it's not caused by natural disaster. Hopefully it's just caused by the aging population, but we will see the, the human population shrink below 11 billion, back down to maybe 10 billion, 9 billion, and then it'll grow back up again. But Earth obviously has a carrying capacity. We do not have unlimited resources. Uh, we're already facing severe water shortages in certain parts of the planet. We're already facing, you know, people in people in Kenya and in Yemen are dying of famine. They don't have enough food. So, um, you know, there is a carrying capacity on our planet and eventually we will exceed that carrying capacity and the population will shrink and then it'll go back up and then it'll shrink and go back up. So when we look at this graph, what's the carrying capacity of this population? About approximately. One point five. Correct. Yeah, we can say it's about one point five million. There's also what's called logistic growth. This is growth in which the growth rate levels off as the population reaches its carrying capacity due to limiting limited resources. So this looks more like an S curve rather than a J curve it's called logistic growth. It's a log graph. Population increases dramatically at first and then it levels off. Okay. All right. So unfortunately, we do need to do one thing before we jump into these presentations. I'm pretty annoyed about it, but we just have to go ahead and do it. Uh, Okay, I'm about to send a link to the chat. Thank you for joining us, Dante. All good. All right, <clears throat> I'm sending a link to the chat. I need you guys to click on that link. We need to do a quick tutorial, hopefully it's quick, in preparation for our EOC.
Um, once you've once you've gotten into the link, please send a message to the chat saying here. Thank you, Joseph. Thank you, Adrian. Thank you, Alicia. Um, Jalen, Stephanie, please let me know that you guys are in, that you've clicked on the link. Olivia, <clears throat> Angel. What's that, Gabby? I don't see the link in the chat. Oh, okay. It needs recent. Thank you, Dante. Thank you, Jalen. I'm also just going to send it to you, everybody who has it. <clears throat> Sorry, I know some of you had already opened it, but I just wanted to send it to everybody. Okay. So once you're there, let me find the directions. So you've got to select the option that says NC test tutorial. So not the one that says NC test login, but the one that says NC test tutorial. It's the bottom right square. And then obviously you are going to select the option that says biology tutorial. I can see Joseph doing it, Olivia, Jalen, Stephanie, Adrian. Thank you. Hey, Angel, I just got your email. <clears throat> okay, I'm going to begin reading this script that I have to read in the next 30, 30 seconds or so. So make sure that you have clicked on the NC test tutorial and then clicked on and selected your, your uh, EOC, the EOC biology tutorial. If you regularly use test read aloud, or if you regularly change the font size, or if you regularly have a colored background, then you can select that during the tutorial. If not, then do not use those options during this tutorial. OK, let's go ahead and begin. So today you will complete the end of course online assessment tutorial for high school biology. Your answers will not be saved, and you will not receive a score. This activity is not a test, but it will help you understand what to do on the day you take the test. As you look at your device, you should see a screen that says start. During the actual test, you will see your name, your student identification number, and your school name at the top of the screen. You will see an exit button on every page, but do not click or touch the exit button because it will log you out of the test. 
if the exit or home button is clicked or touched accidentally, your teacher will have to log you back into the online exam. While you are answering questions, be careful not to click, hover, or touch for touch screen devices near the edge of the screen. Doing this will close your screen and you will have to be logged back into the tutorial. Scroll bars are available if you cannot see all the questions on the screen. Click start to begin the tutorial. A pop-up box will display asking you to confirm the tutorial before you begin. You should see EOC, High School English 2, NC Math 1, NC Math 3, and Biology tutorial in the box. Click OK to continue. You should Mr. see, Rook, yes. Uh, I just want to let you know my screen is still loading, so I don't really know. OK, I'll slow down for now. I, let me see. Okay, so my screen just now so what was that? What did you say, Gabby? It finished loading. Okay. It finished loading. Uh, Castro, I cannot see your screen. Um, Adrian, go ahead and click start or log in. It's not actually going to ask you to log in. It's just the tutorial. Jalen, you too. Go ahead and click log in. Uh, and then you can click continue, and you should be taken to the first question. Or start, I'm sorry, I should say start. Okay. Near the top of the screen is a toolbar with several tools you can practice using today. The practice question is below the toolbar. To move from question to question during the tutorial, you will use the navigation buttons located at the bottom of the screen. Are there any questions? The first five questions are reading. Look at question one. The information for you to read is on the left side of the screen and the question and answer choices are on the right side of the screen. There is a divider bar in the middle if you want to adjust the screen. If the passage is too big for the screen, there will be a scroll bar you can use. Okay, read the passage and then answer the first question. Let's look at the tools on the toolbar at the top of your screen. Most of the tools may be clicked one time to turn them on and clicked a second time to turn them off. First, find the tool that looks like a curved arrow. This is called the reset tool. You will not be able to click the reset tool until you mark an answer choice and the arrow turns black. Use the reset tool if you need to clear the answer choice you selected. Let's practice. If you did not mark an answer choice, click answer choice A now. The reset tool arrow turns black. Now click the reset tool. 
a caution message appears on the screen to make sure you really want to clear your answer choice. Now click the reset button in the caution box to remove your answer and reset the answer choices. Are there any questions about the reset tool? Okay, no questions, good. The next tool is the flag tool, which allows you to flag any questions you want to review later. There are two ways to flag a question. You can either click the square box to the left of the word flag, or you can click the flag button. Clicking the square box or the flag button will put a check mark in the square box. To remove the check mark, click the flag button or the square box again. For multiple choice questions, you will have a tool that looks like a circle with an X over it. This is the strike tool. When you click it, your pointer becomes an X. This tool allows you to put an X on answers you don't think are correct. If you would like to remove an X from any answer choice, the, click the X to remove it. When you are ready to answer the question, click the strike button again to turn off the strike tool. Do you have any questions about how to use the tools I've explained to you? Okay. The navigation buttons are below the question. The first button takes you back to the first question. The back button moves the screen back one question. The pause button opens the screen that keeps other students from seeing your screen during stretch breaks or if you must leave your device before finishing. The next button moves the screen to the next question. The review button takes you to the end of the section. Are there any questions about the navigation buttons at the bottom of the screen? Now, click the next button at the bottom of the page so that question two displays on your screen. Now let's practice using the three highlighter tools on question two. The first highlighter tool looks like a small highlighter pen and lets you highlight words. When you click the highlight tool, the tool is turned on and your pointer changes to an icon that looks like a highlighter. To use it, click, hold, and drag your pointer over the text you want to highlight on the screen. When you are finished with the highlight tool, click the highlight button to turn it off. Try using the first highlighter tool now. The second highlighter tool looks like a highlighter pen with a line through it. This tool allows you to erase some of the highlight you added to words. Click the tool to turn it on, and your pointer becomes the unhighlight tool. To use it, click the screen and use your pointer like you would use an eraser or on paper to remove highlight from words. Practice using this tool now by erasing some of the highlight you have on your screen from when we used the first highlighter tool. When you are finished, click the unhighlight button to turn it off. The third highlighter tool looks like a highlighter pen with an X through it. This tool lets you remove or clear all the highlight at one time. Click the unhighlight button to remove all the highlight on your screen. Are there any questions about how to use the highlighter tools?
Now read the passage and mark an answer for question two on your screen. Now click the next button at the bottom of the page so that the question three displays on your screen. We will now look at the final tool on the toolbar. Find the icon with a question mark inside a circle. This is called the help tool. If you can't remember how the tools or navigation work, you can click the help button. Click the help tool now. You will see explanations of different tools and navigation buttons. When you click on the help tool, there may be some information that you do not need. Some question types only appear on certain tests. Click outside the help screen to close the box. Are there any questions? Use the tools and follow the instructions on each page to answer questions three, four, and five. You may choose to use the flag button for one of these questions so that you can see how that tool works. Raise your hand if you need help. So, I mean, again, this is not graded. You guys can just literally go through and just click anything. It doesn't matter. Next on your screen, click next on your screen. The next question is a constructed response that requires a written answer. After reading the question, type your answer in the space provided. Again, not graded. We won't have any written answer questions on the biology EOC, so just type, maybe just type your name really quickly, or NA or something. Click next on your screen. The next three questions are biology questions. Follow the instructions on your screen to answer these questions. So questions seven through nine should be biology questions. Can't believe this, how long is this? Click next on your screen. Now you will begin the mathematics portion of the tutorial. A calculator is not allowed for these questions. Follow the instructions on the screen to answer these two questions. You may practice using the tools on the toolbar on these questions. Is Joseph doing, Joseph, are you doing this right now? Are you doing this tutorial? Dante, are you doing this tutorial? Yeah, I'm just running through it. Okay. I only ask you all specifically because I can't see your screens. Uh, Malachi, are you doing it? Also can't see your screen. Kiki, are you doing it? Thank you, Dante. So Malachi and Kiki, let me know if you all are doing this so I can check your names off and they don't come for you or me. All right. Click either next or review to move to the section summary. This screen shows you the number of questions you completed and the number of questions you flagged to go back to later. If you answered the question, there will be an asterisk under it. If you flag the question to go back to later, it will have a question mark under it. 
If you didn't answer every question, or if you want to go back and check the questions you flagged, click the question number and it will take you back to that question. Click any question number to see how this works. When you are finished checking your answers, click the review button. Click the next button at the bottom of the screen. A caution box appears asking if you are sure you want to go to the next screen, the next section. Once you have moved past this screen, you will not be able to return to these questions. Click the next button in the caution box. You will now begin the calculator active part of the mathematics questions. For these questions, you are allowed to use the online calculator, a handheld calculator, or both if you choose. If you would like a handheld calculator, raise your hand. Blah, 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 blah. Click continue to move to the first calculator active question. Click continue to move to the first calculator active question. In the top right hand corner of the screen, you should see a small calculator. This is your online calculator. Click on the calculator and it will open on your screen. Now answer the next four math questions using a calculator. Not graded, please just click something so we can finish this. <laughs> Click the next button. This screen is the test summary page for the last four questions you answered. This is the end of the tutorial. Click the end test button. A caution box will pop up on the screen after you click end test. You cannot go back to, an to answer any of the questions after you click end test. Everyone should have answered all the questions in this tutorial. Click the end test button now. A large stop sign will appear to let your teacher know that you have completed the tutorial. Are there any questions? You have completed the end of course online assessment tutorial for high school English 2, North Carolina Math 1, North Carolina Math 3, and Biology. So I've marked that those of you who I can see your screen, I've marked you've done it. Angela, I know you still need to go in and kind of finish it. Uh, Kiki, if you're here, please let me know if you've done it. Malachi, if you're here, please let me know if you've done it. At this point, we don't have time to do the project, but I will say for to do the presentations. But I will say that only three groups so far have successfully placed their projects into the folder. So that means that four groups or four partners have not. Oh, my bad. I was finna, uh, I forgot that you said post it in there. I was finna actually go in and post it into the canvas. Yeah, no, I, I just wanted, I wanna turn it into this folder. Um, so this, we have 15 minutes left in class. I wanna make sure every, every partner, partner group does that. I've gotten submissions from Ayana and whoever her partner is. Uh, I've gotten submissions from Alicia and whoever her partner is. And I've gotten a submission from Malachi and whoever his partner is. So let me see if I can actually pull up partners. So Alicia and Angel, your presentation is submitted. Gabby and Ayana, your presentation is submitted. And Malachi and Joseph, your presentation is submitted. Um, 
That means that who else is on this call? Castro, I need your presentation to be dropped into the into the Google folder. Um, Dante and Olivia, your presentation. Stephanie and Jalen, your presentation, and Adrian and Kiki, I need your presentation. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen so that I can walk one of those four groups through how to do that. Who would like to go first? Castro, Dante, Olivia, Stephanie, Jalen, Adrian, or Kiki? Hello, Castro, Adrian, Kiki, Olivia, Dante, Jalen, Stephanie. One of you needs to share. Gabby, yeah, you're all good, right? Mm -hmm. All right, thank you, Jalen. So go ahead and share your screen for me, please. Okay, so um, click, first of all, click on the link that I just sent to the chat. Yeah. Okay, and then click on the drop down arrow next to human activities and the, yep. Click on add shortcut to drive. Click on the arrow next to my drive. Click on the arrow next to your biology folder. and just add shortcut. Good. Okay, now go into your presentation. Go to file, oh yeah, right there, that's good. Yep. It would no go up, scroll up. Click on the arrow next to the human, yeah. And then click on move here. Yep. Okay, excellent. Thank you. So that means Jalen and Stephanie are good. So who wants to go next? Castro? Dante or Olivia, I think both of them. Oh, there's Dante. He's still here. Or so Castro, Dante, or Adrian and Kiki. Thanks, Jalen.
Kiki, Adrian, Dante, Castro, Okay, so once you do that, Dante, please make sure you uh, add it to that, that folder. So go ahead and at this point, just add the folder to your biology Google folder so you'll have access to it. So I want to try to make a slide and add it to the. Okay, so I think that's his name, but I can't make one. I have it done today. All right, so Adrian, let's respond to yours first. We need to do one. I'm not sure how to make a slide and add it to the folder. All right, so why don't you share your screen, Adrian, and I can walk you through through that. All right, so I see you have the folder open. Can you go to that folder, that tab? Yep. Click on the drop down, human activities in the, yep. <clears throat> Add a shortcut to drive. Click on the arrow next to my drive. And click on the arrow next to biology folder. And then click on add shortcut. Okay, great. So now that now this folder is in your biology folder. There's a shortcut to it in your biology folder. But while we're here, what click on new. And then Google Slides, yeah. Create and share. Your topic is, you're working with Kiki, and your topic is bioaccumulation. I can send how to spell that into the chat. Bioaccumulation. So Kiki, if you are here, you and Adrian are working together. So while we are here, Adrian, um, once you finish with the name, let me, uh, well, I'll be able to see it. 
It should be M U. A C C U M U. Dante, you and Olivia are working on invasive species. All of the information that you need is available on Canvas too, in an assignment called U9 B1 Hunters Anthropogenic Partner Presentations. Uh, hold on, hold on, oh, Adrian. Okay, I wanted you to share your presentation with with Kiki, Adrian. Do you know how to do that? I know that. Yeah, I know how to do it though. Okay. Castro, do you, this, this, uh, hold on for a second. That's it. I need you to get onto Canvas and look at the details of the assignment because all of the questions that you're asking can be answered or are answered there. Where do I find the instructions for the project? Where do you find the what? The instructions for the project. Uh, there's an assignment on Canvas called U9B1 Honors Anthropogenic Partner Presentations. It's in the Unit 9 module right under the first day, under day one. That's where you can find all the instructions. Okay, it's 11.35 now. Uh, I do need you all to finish these presentations because we will present on Monday the 30th when we come back from this five day break. Um, but I appreciate your patience today. I hope you all have a great Thanksgiving break, uh, some time to relax, some time to spend time with family and loved ones, some time to reflect, and also some time to be productive. Uh, I will talk to you all on Monday. Let me know if you need anything between now and then. Uh, Mr. Roy, when does the 